Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to our Toronto Air and Robotics L seminar. Today we are glad to have Jun Gao to give a talk on towards generative modeling of 3D objects learned from images. Jun Gao is a PhD student at the University of Toronto with Professor Sonia Fidler. He is also a research scientist at NVIDIA's Toronto Air Lab, led by Sonia. He obtained his bachelor's degree from Peking University in 2018. His research mainly focuses on 3D deep learning and its interaction with 2D images. So yeah, Jim, we're all looking forward to your talk. The stage is yours. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for having me here and thanks for this nice introductions. Um, so today I'm going to talk about our efforts towards building a generative model for 3D object learned from the 2D images. Um, to begin with, so creating 3D content is one of the most fundamental problems in computer vision and has many applications, such as gaming. In this video, I'm showing a recording from GTA 5. In this game, people need to create a large-scale city, which has a lot of different cars, human characters, buildings, trees, etc. 3D content creation also enables other applications, like film. In this movie of, of Avatar, people need to create the whole virtual environment including trees, animals, and all kinds of different vegetations. In the autonomous driving, 3D content creation is also an important factor right now. It, it is often hard to train the robots or driving cars on real environments, which can be inefficient or unsafe. Developing a large scale of 3D content can help us to build a good simulator, which allows us to train the robots like self-driving cars in safety critical scenarios. 3D content creations also enable the future of metaverse. Where we, need to build a, where we need to simulate a large scale of virtual world with not just humans, but also all different kinds of objects that we can create in the real world. Among many of these different applications, one of the most important components is a 3D object. In particular, we need to have the power to create a large scale of different 3D objects to support all of these different uh, applications. To simulate the virtual world, the scalability of 3D object generation is crucial. First, we need to generate millions of different objects. For example, for the cars, if looking from a holistic view, they are very similar. But when we focus on the details, they have minor differences. Second, we need to generate a diverse set of the objects. Even for animals, there are millions of different animal species in the world. And we have not just animals, but also many other types of objects like plants or some man-made objects in the real world scenario. And finally, the quality should also scale up. We hope to generate as high quality as possible to produce the details for both geometry and textures. However, manually creating 3D content requires tremendous human efforts. It requires human expertise on development tools such as Maya or Blender, as well as the capability for artistic modeling. It needs a lot of people to spend a huge amount of time. In this video, I'm showing one artist creating one car. It takes hours and days to do this job. Therefore, only relying on human effort is very hard to scale up in terms of quantity, quality, and also diversity. On the other side, in recent years, machine learning has achieved amazing progress in many domains especially in the 2D image generation. In this slide, I'm showing four representative works, ImageGen, DALI2, Gauguin, and StyleGen. They allow the users to create photorealistic images using controls like text, sketches, or semantic masks. However, these are still only 2D images. Using AI to create 3D objects is far behind the progress than that in the 2D image domain. And my research is trying to develop AI tools for generating 3D objects. 3D generated model has a very long history. In the past years, people have developed methods for 3D generation in the form of voxels, mesh, implicit functions, or point clouds. However, some of these works require 3D supervision, which are very hard to acquire in the real world data. And they are mainly focusing on the geometry and neglect the texture, which all is also an important factor for the 3D generation. Texture 3D again can generate geometry with texture, but things that deform it from a template sphere mesh, they're limited to a fixed topology, and thus they're hard to generate mesh with different topology, for example, a donut. 
more recently, with the progress on the neuron volume rendering and 2D generated model, a lot of works are starting to work with 3D aware 2D generated models. However, since they're still based on implicit function, it is hard to edit or realize the generated 3D assets in standard graphic engines. Besides, since the cost of volume rendering is ex expensive, there's a trade-off on the training efficiency and multi-view consistency. This can lead into suboptimal sub results in generating 3D objects. On the contrary, what are we aiming for? We aim for directly generate the 3D object with textures and materials. Furthermore, the object should have arbitrary topology, such as genus greater than zero, as the real world object can be arbitrarily complex. And lastly, we hope to learn from the 2D images, satisfying the requirements of the 3D data. This is a very challenging problem. How should we tackle this problem? Before we look into the technical details, let's, let's step back and look at what a general 3D generation pipeline could be. This will help us to think of what we need to build for 3D object generation. In general, 3D generation is something like this. With some input, which can be a latent code sample from a prior distribution, we then have a neural network that encodes this input and then decode the 3D shapes in some format that can be utilized in downstream applications, such as simulation, robotics, or gaming. Therefore, if you look into this pipeline, there are several challenges in this pipeline. The first challenge is a 3D representation. <clears throat> it affects how we design the neural network architecture but also how we utilize it in the downstream applications. Therefore, a proper 3D representation should be first, suitable for machine learning, and second, easy for the use in the downstream applications. And lastly, better to have the, uh, to represent object with object topology and supporting textures and materials. The second challenge is the learning algorithms. It involves not just how we design the network architecture, but also how we train the neural networks that we designed. In the following slides, I will talk about our efforts to solve these challenges and build a 3D generating model in the end. Let's first focus on the uh, 3D representation part. In the recent years, neural field-based representations has achieved very promising progress, such as deep SDF, occupancy network, or NERF. They are very suitable for machine learning with a continuous definition in the 3D field. And it can also represent objects with complex geometry and allow topological change in the outlying shapes. On the other side, let's also look at some representative downstream applications, such as real-time rendering, shape deformation, or physical simulation. They are widely used in many graphics domains. Under the hood of these applications, MESH is quite popular. For example, in the real-time rendering, mesh is always used to, to define the BRDF properties on the surface. In the shape deformation or physical simulation, mesh is more intuitive to edit or deform. In the past decades, people have developed many hardware and software tools for accelerating the display design and the manipulations of the meshes. However, neuron field-based representations is hard for these applications. It is not compatible with standard graphics tools, how hard to edit or relight, and mostly they are static. To use a neuron field representations, one typical approach is converting it to mesh through some process such as Martian cubes. However, since this process is always not differentiable, any unsatisfactions in the downstream applications cannot back be backpropagated into the implicit field making it hard to generate content that we really want in these applications. But implicit function still has its unique advantages. How to bridge it with a mesh and solve this non-differentiability issue? Our key idea is to utilize a differentiable isosurfacing operation to differentially convert the deep implicit function into an explicit mesh. And this explicit mesh is the isosurface of the implicit function. Therefore, since the backend is still an implicit function, it supports upshift topology and is suitable for machine learning. Besides, since the output is a mesh, it is also compatible with many current graphics engines. Furthermore, the operation is differentiable. Thus, 
Any gradient from the downstream applications can be backpropagated into the implicit function to allow us to generate the desired 3D content. Formally speaking, given an implicit function f, which maps a 3D location into SDF value, we hope to differentially get the ISO surface on the right. In our work, DMTET, our newest paper last year, we developed a hybrid representation to achieve this goal. In particular, we use Martian tetrahedral to extract the surface. First, we evaluate the implicit field on a discrete tetrahedral grid. Here, red means the inside of the object, and it has a negative sign of SDF. Green means the outside of the object and has a positive sign of SDF. We then identify the tetrahedrons that has vertices with different SDF signs, such as the one as highlighted here. These are the tetrahedrons which intersect the surface encoded by the sign distance fields. Finally, the exact zero crossing point along grid edge are determined by the linear interpolation. Here, VA and VB denotes the locations of vertices in the grid edge. FVA and FVB is the sign distance at that location. VAB prime here is the interpolated point. Connecting this interpolated point will give us a triangular mesh. Intuitively speaking, since VAB prime is a continuous function of sign distance value FVA and FVB, the gradient from, from the VAB prime can be backpropagated into the deep implicit function F, thus allowing us to change the topology of the shape. Let's look at this again. The interpolated point on the ISO surface is defined through a continuous function of the sign distance values at each grid location. Thus, during training, suppose we have a loss function defined on the extracted surface. The gradient from it can be backpropagated into the SDF values via the chain rule, thus allowing us to change the topologies of the shape. To demonstrate this, we provide a 2D example. Here, we have an initial surface shown in red, and we want to fit this surface to the purple point cloud. We can peel the chamfer distance between the red surface and, and ground truth point clouds. And we backpropagate back the loss back to the SDF values at each vertex. Here, we use the colors to, to denote the sign of SDFs. Red means negative and green means positive. Let's see how the optimization can go. As we can see in this animation, the red initialization can gradually move towards the ground truth point. However, when we're looking closely, we still have some artifacts, such as the one as highlighted here. We find that representing the SDF with a fixed grid may not be the best strategy, since it is hard to only change the SDF to match the complex surface of this spanning. Therefore, we first jointly optimize the formation for each vertex. Since the gradient from the interpolated point VAB prime here can also backpropagate it to the locations of the grid vertices VA and VB here. And this can allow us to adapt the grid to locally learn better alignment with the surface. Let's see a comparison between this one and the one without optimizing the deformation. As we can see in this result, when we allow the optimization for both SDF values and deformations on the vertices, we can obtain much better alignment with local details of the shape. This example tells that the Martian tetrahedral algorithms is differentiable and we can utilize it to optimize the ISO surface of an implicit function. We apply our method to the 3D shape synthesis from cross voxels. The input is a cross voxel as shown on the left. We compare our method with strong implicit baseline convolutional occupancy network. And our method is able to generate much finer geometric details since machine tetrahedra allows us to directly supervise on the surface. Notice that the output is a mesh and can have different topology for different objects. Now we have DMTED, our first building block that allows us to generate mesh of object topology. Next, we want to train DMTED from 2D supervisions to alleviate the data requirements and turn it into a generative model.
Uh, hey, June, uh, I'm sorry to interpret, uh, interrupt you. So in the last uh, result, you just shown uh, what is the model trend in some way style or in some GAN style? Like, oh, the model what's here the is, loss? Yeah. Oh, the model here is just an encoder decoder framework. There is not GAN or like a, a VAE style. So uh, the, the task okay. for this one is like, we want to upsample the cross voxels. So the input is this cross voxel mm -hmm. and we encode it into some latent code. Yep. And we decode the 3D shape out from it. And the loss oh, function okay. is, is two sides. It's basically, first we have SDF loss, and we also have the transfer distance defined on the surface, comparing okay. with the ground truth surface. I see, I see. Makes sense. Thanks. So this is not a generative model, right? This is just like um, from cost to find a, a mapping from yes. also to. Okay. Yes, Thank you. exactly. I will talk about the generation like uh, next yep. slides. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, okay, so let's continue. So the next, the next uh, question we are going to tackle is like, how can we build a learning algorithm to allow us to train with 2D images? Because previously in this uh, experiment, we still need the 3D ground truth to train with. But 3D ground truth data is very hard to acquire in the real world. So, okay. So, and, and the task we are solving right now is like a multi-view 3D reconstructions. And this task is basically given multi-view images with known cameras as shown on the top left corner here. And we hope to reconstruct the 3D geometry, materials, and lighting from multi-view images. And this is our paper in the CVPR this year. The key idea is, not, is actually very simple. We combine the differentiable ISO surfacing with differentiable rendering in particular. We first to use deep matching tat to extract the geometry of the shapes, which is give us the, uh, which can give us a triangular mesh. We also use a neuron field to represent the texture. In particular, given X, Y, Z locations, we output an RGB colors of that location. We then use differential rendering to render the 3D mesh into a 2D images. After that, we can compute the loss functions between the rendered 2D image and the ground truth image. And since the whole pipeline is differentiable, the loss from the render to the image can be backpropagated into the 3D geometry and textures, allowing them to jointly optimize with the end-to-end -end training. We term this model as NVDFRAC, which means NVIDIA differentiable reconstruction. Here is some of the results. With multi-view images, we can reconstruct both the 3D mesh and the materials out from these images. And since our model outputs a mesh, it supports many editing operations from the graphics engine. First, material editing. Here, we change the materials on the surface of the reconstructed object. Second, physical simulation. Here, we add a cross on top of this object and drop this off. We can get the meaningful interactions between this object and the clothes. Lastly, relighting. We can see the output image changes with the lighting and the viewing directions. Note that these applications are all hard to do in NERV. In NERV. Our model is also able to reconstruct objects with thin structures. Here on the left is our result, and right is a ground truth. After optimization, we can generate many thin structures and is very close to the ground truth data. With this method, our model powers NVIDIA drive scene featured in the GTC 2022 last month. Let's see how our method can work in practice. So we can first reconstruct the background scene with the input videos. And after these things, we can reconstruct the, um, the we can harvest this single object from the real world data. Let me stop here. So we have the full videos in the U U YouTube. And the way to extract this, uh, this 3D assets is through this like uh, MVD frack. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, Jude. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry for interrupting. So uh, okay. in order to, so it looks like you're using this 2D image as a ground truth mm -hmm. to super to create this 3D model, right? Yes. 
and uh, you said you need you need to have this known camera. Uh, what what yes. does mean known camera? Is it is known camera pose or? Uh, it's no camera pose. So we assume we not have known the camera intrinsics and extrinsics. So how do we get extrinsic? Are we using some slam technology to get this at um, camera pose or? So it depends on the data set. So for some data set, they, for some data set, we can get the camera poses. For example, the self-driving cars, we know the camera location, we know the car locations, and we also know the camera location for the cars. And for some synthetic data set, we also know the uh, know the camera poses. It's given in the data set. And also for some other data set, which I guess in um, in this data set, the cameras can be estimated from co map. I see. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So one more question. That uh, so in order to get a reliable three D reconstruction. Uh, do you have like a rust meet how many views do we actually need to get a reliable reconstruction yeah that's a very great question so we didn't do too much application studies in our paper but i think we need at least maybe like 40 or 50 views like in this example here we have 100 like so, and, 100. This, uh, and this 100 that uh, it has uh, uh, not just the number of views right it also had the good coverage right i guess for this uh, reconstruction yes uh, I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So 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 previously in 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 the last two part of this talk, I presented the three representations, like which allows us to extract the mesh, and also the dummy diffract, which can allow us to train with two D images. And now we are ready to build a three D generating model that can generate 3D objects and learn from the 2D images. Let's see how this can work. So the, our main intuition to do that is this. So 2D GANs has, a, has amazing performance in generating photorealistic 2D images. And we should make use of this success and bring it into 3D generation. And this success including two things. First, 2D GANs has been exploring different ways of supervising on the 2D images with many powerful 2D discriminator architectures. And second, 2D GANs also have developed a lot of powerful 2D generators that enables generating at high quality. And how can we bring these advances into the 3D generation? For the first one, supervising in 2D. We are thinking to use differential rendering, which differentially renders the 3D assets into the 2D images. And after that, we can apply the supervisions on the render to the images and backwards it into the 3D generation. For the second one, generating in 2D. We are thinking to utilize the triplane representations for generations. And then we can combine these triplane representations with DMTED or NVDefract to first differentially generate the mesh and then render it into the 2D images. Here is our overall pipeline. We first have two prior distributions, one representing the texture and the other for the geometry. Each of them is a Gaussian distribution. The main reason why we have these two latent is because same geometry can have te different textures and same texture styles can be applied to different geometry. We further to utilize the 3D generator to generate a 3D texture mesh, which I will talk about in details in the next slides. This is our inference stage. During training, we first randomly sample a camera from the, from the distributions of the training data sets. And then we can generate 2D images, to like two images. One is the RGB image and the other is a 2D silhouette. We have two different discriminators, one for the RGB image and one for the 2D silhouette. And each of these discriminator is trying to classify whether the image are real or fake. And since the whole pipeline is differentiable, the render is differentiable, and the way we extract the mesh is also differentiable, the gradient from the discriminator can be backpropagated into the, our 3D generator, allowing us to train our 3D generative model. And this is an overview of our training pipeline. And then the key question we need to tackle is like, how can we build a differentiable 3D generator for texture mesh and making the whole pipeline training end to end? The main idea is still utilize our previous work, deep machine tests. In particular, our main network architectures adopts from the style game. We first have a one network for geometry generation. 
which involves a sequence of 3D convolution to generate the feature volume. And then for each vertex in the tetrahedral grid, we sample the features from these feature volumes and predict SDF and the deformation. Here, SI means the SDF of, of each vertex, and delta I here means the deformation for each vertex. With these predictions, we can then use margin tetrahedral to extract the ISO surface of from, this, uh, from the implicit function, which can then give us an um, explicit mesh. For the textures, we utilize uh, triplane representations with inspirations from the EG3D and the convolutional occupancy network. In particular, we first concatenate the geometry and texture latent code, and they utilize a combination of them to generate <coughs> three feature maps. Each feature map is representing one plane in the 3D space. And then for each point on the surface of this extracted mesh, we project this point into the planes and then bilinearly extract the surface, the features from the triplane representation. After that, after we got these feature representations, we can have a simple multi-layer perception to predict the RGB for that locations of this surface point. And then when we combine this to process, we can generate a mesh with, the, uh, with textures. This model gives us some decent performance in generating the 3D cars, like the example I'm showing in this slide. However, we find that although we have two different latent codes, like geometry latent code and texture latent code, they are not fully disentangled when generating the 3D shapes. Here, I'm showing the generated results, where each column share the same geometry latent code and have different texture latent code. Each row here has the same texture latent code, but different geometry latent code. We can see there's no disentanglement between geometry and textures. We hypothesis the reason is because the information flow from the geometry to the texture generator is very limited as we only concatenate the two latent codes when we generate the textured mesh. Such a weak connections make it hard to learn the disentanglement of geometry and textures. And thus the texture generator in the bottom can even learn to ignore the texture latent codes when generating the texture features. And secondly, here, since we have two different networks, one for geometry, and the, the other for the textures. The model needs to generate the 3D twice, which means in the geometry branch, it needs to first reason the 3D shapes from the geometry latent code. And in the texture generator, it will again need to predict the 3D texture field from the latent code. And this texture field needs to align with the geometry branch. This alignment makes it hard, makes the, makes the whole learning pipeline significantly harder and it will cause a lot of capacities in figuring out this alignment. Therefore, to enforce the, the utilizations of the texture latent code, we redesigned our 3D generator. In particular, instead of having two different networks for geometry and texture independently, we combine them into the same network. The generator has two triplane representations, one for the geometry and one for the texture. This can help us reduce the inefficiency in learning 3D structures of the shapes and can give us a better, much better results. After we generate these two feature maps, everything after that is the same as before, where for the geometry, we predict the SDF, SI, and the deformation for each vertex. And we use DMTAD to extract the ISO surface. For the textures, like we project every point into these triplane features of the texture volume of the texture planes. And then we predict the RGB colors for every surface point. With this improvement, our model is able to achieve much better disentanglement than before. Here, we first randomly sample five different shapes. We then swap in two different latent codes between these shapes. Here, each column shares the same texture latent code, and each row shares the same geometry latent code. As we can see in these videos, the geometry and textures are purely disentangled in these results. Above are all the model details. 
let's discuss some advantages of our model. First, it is efficient for training with high resolution images. Since the output is a mesh, rendering a mesh is significantly faster than rendering an implicit function. This allows us to train the 3D generator with 1024 by 1024 image resolutions. And this high resolution image can help us to capture a lot of details in geometry and textures. And second, the mesh we generated can have optical topology since we are using DMTET as our 3D generation. Lastly, our model utilizes 2D images for training as we differentially convert the 3D shapes into the 2D images. And this differential rendering bridges the gaps between 2D and 3D. To train our model, we use the synthetic data set. We train on six different categories, chairs, cars, motorbikes are from the shape net, animals and hearts are from the turbo script, and human characters are from the render people. We train one model for one category. For each 3D asset, we render the images as the resolutions of 1024 by 1024, and we uniformly sample the camera on the sphere. The table below tells us the number of shapes each category and the number of views are we rendered per shape. Note that for the last four categories, we have very limited data sets, but our model can still perform decently well on this data set. Let's first see some qualitative results. Here, I show several examples on the generated geometry and texture. Our model is able to generate very high details in both geometry and textures. For the chairs, we can generate the wheels on the chair legs. For the cars, we can generate the wheels, the lights, and windows. For the animals, we can even generate the open mouth of this box. For the motorbike, we generate the back mirrors, the wireframes on the tires. For the humans, we can even generate the shoes here. Our model is also able to generate novel and interesting shapes. The first option of generating novel shapes is through swapping the textures and, late, and geometry latent code. Here, we first randomly pick two shapes from previous slides. We can then interpret the two latent codes. In these slides, at each column, we fix the geometry and interpret the texture latent code from white to yellow. As we can see, the geometry is the same, but the texture is smoothly changing from white to yellow. At each row here, we fix the texture latent and inter only interpret the geometry latent code. We can see the textures are the same, but the geometry is smoothly transiting from a sports car to an SUV car. We can also generate objects that look similar and have difference locally. Here, we locally perturb the latent code by adding a small noise into the latent code. And we can produce the results like this. For example, in the middle row here, there are all small pandas, but the size of the eyes are different for these pandas. Here, I'm showing our result is able to populate a large, a large cloud of 3D assets by drawing random samples on the prior distributions. Please pay attention to the diversity and the quality of our results. <clears throat> In these slides, I'm showing the generated 3D assets with a random walk on the latent space. Our model is also able to generate a smooth interpolations between different shapes for either chairs, animals, humans, cars, motorbikes, or houses. Our model further supports the text guided 3D shape generation. In particular, we follow the recent work, Stargate Nada, where users can provide a text and we fine tune our 3D generator by computing the directional clip loss on the rendered 2D images and the provided text from the users. The high level intuition is that after user provides some text, 
for example, the anime painting here. The directions from the embeddings of the normal text to the embeddings of the, of the, diff, of the given text prompt should be close to the normal image, should be close to the, to, to the directions from a normal image to a fine-tuned image. And the directional clip loss is trying to minimize these differences between two directions. Here is some of our results. We experimented on cars and animals. On the cars, we have, we have meaningful results on something like rusty cars, taxis, burn cars, etc. Our model is able to generate many different visually pleasing results with a given text. We also show the results on the animals. Here I'm providing some results with text prompts such as tigers, pandas, and Simpsons. Okay. So far, so great. However, all of the experiments we are running before are using pure RGB colors for the textures. It neglects the view-dependent lighting effect. How can we also support the view-dependent lighting effect in this model? Our idea is predicting the materials. And our model is actually very flexible to support predicting the materials. In particular, we need to solve two problems. First, how to generate the materials. And second, after we generate the materials, how can we render it into the, gener into the 2D images? For the generation, it's very simple. We only need to append some more dimensions to reduce the parameters for the materials. In our case, we generate the roughness and, and the metallics in the PBR materials. To render the, render the generated the materials, we adopt our numerous paper last year and utilize the sphere Gaussian to efficiently render the lighting effect with materials. This differential rendering allows us to backward the gradient from the discriminator to the rendered 2D images and then backpropagate it to the material generation. Here is some of our results on generating on generated 3D shapes with materials. Our model is able to generate meaningful base colors and the materials. For example, for the windows and the light, they have high, very high metallics, but very low roughness. While the car body and tires has, low has a lower metallic, but high roughness. When we realize the generated 3D shapes, they all produce meaningful relighting results and highlight speculars. Note that in this experiment, we didn't utilize the ground truth for the materials, and this is unsupervised learned from the 2D images. Let's also visualize it in 3D. Here, I'm showing allotations of our generated 3D cars. We produce meaningful multi-view lighting effects when we rotate the 3D generated 3D assets. In summary, in today's talk, I mentioned three main pain tackling three different aspects in building a generative model for 3D objects. The first is representations. DMTAS supports mesh generations with object topology using differentiable isosurfacing. The second is differential rendering. NVDiffract allows us to reconstruct 3D shapes from 2D images by combining differentiable isosurfacing with differential rendering. And lastly, generative modeling. Gas3D develops a generative model for us to produce a 3D texture mesh with, with materials. And the code with pre-trained models is available in our GitHub web page. Before I finalize these presentations, I will also talk about several future directions that I think worth pushing in the future. The first one is we call universal generation. Right now we are mainly trained on the models like cars, chairs, airplanes, this common object, but the world is much more complex than this small set of categories. It would be better to develop a model that can handle multi-category multi generations. And there are two problems we need to solve. The first is the scale of the data set. As currently the size of most data sets is still not big enough comparing with the 2D images. The second is the modeling. We are mainly based on the stack architectures for our 3D generative model, but is, it is very hard to go beyond single category generations with this backbone. Recent work on Dream Fusion is a very amazing paper 
that can generate many 3D different shapes utilizing only 2D diffusion priors. And one interesting figure, future work would be developing a generative model to, uh, for dream fusions instead of optimizing one particular text plum for one thing. The second direction is a real world 2D image data. Our model was only trained on synthetic data in previous experiments. Here, we try to train it on real world data sets that we created using dataset GAN, our ICLI paper last year. The performance become much worse than previous experiments. There are three challenges we need to solve if we want to go to the real world data. The first is real world data has imperfect cameras. This will introduce noise in generating the 3D from the 2D. And second is the occlusions. Occlusions can make it hard to disentangle the foreground and background scenes. And the third is imperfect 2D masks. Right now, our model still relies on the 2D silhouette to get the geometries from the 2D images. If the 2D silhouette is not perfect, it can affect the generations of the 3D geometry. The last direction is go beyond object generation and do scene generation. We are thinking to utilize the compositionalities into the scene, where each object can be generated with a guest 3D, and we use a scene graph to represent the relative locations between the objects. This is, this, this is um, similar to the neuron scene graph and, and the draft paper from the CVPR last year. And this is the end of my talk, and thanks everyone for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jun. Thanks so much. This is uh, a perfect talk. And now it's the QA sections. Uh, any questions from the audience? Please just unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, Jun, thanks so much. It's really an exciting body of, body of work that you guys have been doing. And uh, we are, of course, big fans of it. Um, I, I have a bunch of questions. I, I guess I, I get uh, maybe started was the first so one one issue that uh, that we still see like in generative models is they they perform kind of bad with like generating complex symbolic uh, mm -hmm. so, symbolic like aspects for me yes. uh, like you know generating letters and generating fingers seems to be one two different facets of the same underlying problem now for scene generation, this is uh, sometimes uh, what you would want, right? You, you would, particularly if you generate humans, uh, but also for other objects. For humans, we have good priors and there is research that focuses exclusively on humans, but, mm -hmm. but like for other types of deformed objects, even if you go to animals, you don't have a prior, you, at least you wouldn't want to have a prior for each individual animal category. So what, do you, yeah, it's do you have any thoughts on like this uh, this problem in the context of content creation? For content creation, it's like even a broader problem space because sometimes <laughs> you would want to generate animals that don't even exist, like virtual animals. Yeah, that's a very great question. So I think that so let me decompose the problem a little bit. So the first one is like suppose we want to go to the symbolic thing suppose we want to go to the scene generations this is very similar to what i'm talking here like basically like like if we when people are describing the thing we are not describing the the scene in the holistic views right we are saying we are always saying there's a car in here there's a car there there's a building here something like that and this kind of symbol is basically the, the rough structures of the scene it's not this is purely kind of disentangled from the geometry or texture aspect we didn't care about these things we just we only know rough structures of the scene. This is the first level of the uh, symbolic reasoning of what the scene should look like. This is purely symbolic. There's no any 3D information on this side. And my thinking is, I suppose we re really want to go to this very kind, of very large scale of the generation of, of or like creating the content in this scales. We need to in incorporate the knowledge into the 3D generations. And the way to incorporate this knowledge somehow like we can have two layers of generations. We are in the first layer, we generate these symbolic connections between the objects. For example, where is the cars, where is the buildings and how they are connected, what the relative locations between each object in the scene. And after we have this kind of this graph structures of the scene, we can then generate the, like each component, I can go, I can go to the car, hey, say so given this graph, this global scene structures, how I can generate this part of the scene. Basically, 
how I can generate this card. And this should be much more easier compared to I want to generate everything at, at, the, um, at the same time. So this is like uh, the first part. And the second part is basically how we can go to the, how we can generate thing structures, how we can generate the, um, the animals with maybe the physical simulations of the different any animatable animals. So I thought about that, and that this is a very hard problem to be honest. And one thinking that I really like is somehow in the recent works, they are like it depends on two things. So for the humans, we have priors, which are such as a simple model. We have the very perfect like human skeletons and how we can apply the skinning ways from human skeletons into the uh, into the final 3D shape. This is very well well done, like very well known research directions, we, there's, like yeah. for humans, we can maybe somehow generate, generate skinning weight or generate, generating the skeleton for that. And suppose we want to go to another side, which is very kind of very general. Suppose I want to generate arbitrary, arbitrary, suppose my cat or my dogs, this is, or like even some other animals. This is very, very general settings. And in this kind of general set, we need to have a general model, which means there, there's some recent work we call like not from our group, but from the, go from Andrew Skyger, which they call the occupancy flow, which is basically they, uh, they use a network to run the ODE equations of the, uh, of the dynamics of an object. So basically they have one network to predict like given, given the initial shapes and also the time step T, what's the, uh, what's the deformations from the initial shape from the time step Ts. And this deform since this deformation is encoded through some implicit functions then we can also uh, tolerate, tolerate to some topological changes in this, um, in to apply the simulations or like to generate the dynamic object in these pipelines, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's super interesting. One one more uh, question, maybe in that context, mm -hmm. if you guys allow. Um, so there, you know, both in robotics and in computer vision, there is uh, there is now like this big emergence of integrating integrating language and. In practice, if you look at the robotics practitioners, but also at practitioners building vision mm -hmm. or graphic systems, none of them use actually language prompts for, mm -hmm. for, for their day work. And you guys have been now working like a lot on like digital co content creation. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is, what, what do you see as the workflow for content creators? Like uh, given you have great generative models, what, mm -hmm. what, what is there left to do for the artists or the content creators for, at film studios that operate these models? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. And that actually one research direction that I think like really lacks of explorations in the current literature. So basically um, many of current results or like current three generating model we are doing lacks the controllability. And the control building means like how I can control the final generations of the output. And this is actually one limitations of our work, which is basically um, when we want to generate 3D shapes, suppose maybe here or like here, maybe in, in, in this slide, we can generate so many 3D shapes, but how can we control the 3D shapes? This is like, this is like, um, and this control can be in the form of many different ways. It can be in the form of language. For example, the artist can say, suppose artist saying, so I want the, I want the tiles to be a little bit larger, or I, this can be the language. Or maybe the artist can draw some sketches on the 3D, 3D space, and then we learn to like uh, manipulate some local patches of the object by considering this um, this interactions from the uh, from the artist. So this is somehow one direction that we didn't do too much, and also in the literature there's not so many works doing. Right. I see some works, but not too much to be honest. And to solve this one, there are two problems. Not, um, some problems we need to do. The first is the modeling side. So this is basically like, suppose I only want to do the text as some, as some input and I want to generate 3D from this text. Even for the model, we didn't have so, so many amazing like models that can like given text from and generate 3D shape out from that. Like, we have some results like here, like given text and we generate, but the result is not perfect. Like I wouldn't say this is like, like a production level, production ready. This is definitely definitely not. So this is means like the model side with relaxed the exploration. And the second is like, what's the best UI with the artist? This is also a very, very kind of un, unclear question also to me, which is like, 
what's the best way to interact with humans? And we talk to some people and someone we need something, something, something in general that we hope to do is that we hope to have some UIs that can have something like progressively, progressive reasoning of the three shape. For example, I first give you some cars like this rusty cars and maybe you don't like the, the windows of, of this car, so maybe you don't like the, the head of, of, of this car. And then we can go to that, zoom into that, that, that level of detail and say, I want to change this part. So this is more or less, we want to do something like hierarchical ways of interactions with the humans, where we first do some global shapes, I will give you something, and we can gradually zoom into some detail to say, I want to do this part modification or that part of mo modification. But this is, this is still not like, uh, uh, we still didn't do get too much great result on this kind of directions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it is. I think also like a kind of complicated. It's like a complicated mm -hmm. research problem on its own. Once you have great generative models, like yes. even from the HCI perspective, what is a good way to to edit those models? And of course, my people might say language, but even language, it's very hard to make fine grade. Mm -hmm grained editings with language at this point yes. like saying edit this small piece by a few centimeters or something like that mm -hmm. yeah okay i don't want to take away all question time so if someone else has hi jim uh mm -hmm. i have a question i didn't really get how the this entanglement is achieved by the improved uh generator Seems like it's more the network structure is most it's even more symmetric and uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah how do you like uh, enhance in this entanglement using this new uh, new generator? Yeah, that's something I uh, I thought I because like due to the time I didn't mention it. this is the reason why we have that is because this architecture very detailed architecture change. So the way we generate these two features is that we carefully design the network architecture to generate two different feature volumes. So um, the main intuition is that like geometry features should only depend on the geometry latent codes, right? Like yeah. when I change the texture, we shouldn't change the geometry, but the texture features should depend on both geometry and texture latent codes. Because when I want to change a different cars and the texture field should also change. If I zoom, if I enlarge the cars, and the way, and thus to take this at, into account of the generations, we design the architecture like this. So on the top part of, of these figures, we have this two geo. Two geo is just like one by one convolutions. So in the middle is something like a convolutional generation. This is the typical backbone of generation. And two geo means that we want to convert this feature backbone into the geometry feature latent code. And the key design is that. When we fit in this latent geometry latent code, we fit the geometry latent code into both this backbone and also this two geo branch. And that means this geometry feature is, is purely depends on this geometry latent code. And then we have a second branch, which is like taking this texture features, texture latent code into this two texture branch. And so that means if I have the only generations, I can fix this geometry latent. Like basically the top part is fixed, but I, and then I can change the bottom part bottom one, which is two texts. So that means I can, for the same geometry, I can like sample a lot of different texture latent code and saying that after I sample this different texture, they should also, after I sample this different texture latent code, the output 3D shape should still look realistic. And in this way, we can somehow learn the disentanglement between geometry and textures. So, uh, so in this way, it seems like, um... When I say it, so in the original version, it seems like there's only one concatenation, but here <laughs> it's like the geometric latency is more involved in the generation of textures. Yes. Uh, uh, I think that's a change, right? But still it's uh, just from the network structure, it's still possible that uh, mm -hmm. the output ign totally ignores oh, the texture branch. Well, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So so you are right. So in our experiment, we do find that. So um, the way to learn this disentanglement it's also depend on the size of, of, of the data set. Uh, like, yeah. so like, like I agree with you, like it can still learn to ignore this part, to be honest, like it can still, but there are two ways to make it cannot, dis, uh, cannot ignore. So the first one is that how we can fit in this text. Like, so we are doing something similar to style, which is like, uh, they call it uh, style modulation. So we will 
like, so we will know that this texture layer will always affect the final feature maps. Like, so it cannot ignore like by design. Yep. This is the first part. And second is the scale of the data set. So in the, uh, for the shape net cars, like we see the best disentangle disentanglement on the shape net cars because the number of shapes is very big. But for the other data sets, like the animals, we didn't see too much disentanglement, to be honest. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. No problem. So I have a question regarding the uh, model training. So GAN mm -hmm. is famous for the instability, uh, sorry, uh, unstable yes. training. Do you have a hard time training it? Like, is the training of this get 3 d also very tricky? Uh, it's not that kind tricky. of. So, uh -huh. so we only have one. We only have one hyperparameter to tune. Like, uh, we call it oh. this R one localization. So, actually, I really like the style game code base because, like, it's very like they make it very efficient and they make it very stable for training. So, if you start your training from scratch, yeah. like. Like I think I have published the code in the GitLab. You can try it, and it should it should work out of the box. I see. So it, yeah. is this the gradient penalty or the? Uh yes, power? this is the gradient penalty. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Uh, and on the other hand, so like uh, nowadays, the most I would say popular generative mm -hmm. model is like diffusion model, and yes. I guess I think you are like <laughs> have you already like like as a future work to combine diffusion model with 3D generation. Yeah, I think that could be a very, very important direction we should push is that how we can combine the, because like this is also one limitation we have is that we are based on the, this GAN base. And the GAN base is very hard to scale up. Basically, mm -hmm. I think the, the major problem for the GAN based generating model is like it's hard to scale up to the very large scale of generation. So we only see some very good result on like human faces. This is the most promising result in the GAN based generating model. We have uh, for very large scale generations, like a DALI 2 image gen or like, a, like a image net generating models, like diffusion model wins a lot in that direction. So I think if we really want to scale things up, like I want to go to very, very high resolution, I want to go to very large scale of the 3D generation, I want to cover many different, different kinds of objects in the real world. So diffusion model is like one way to go somehow. Yeah, but it's like, how can we generalize the future model from 2D to 3D? It seems to be. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting direction. And any other questions from the audience? <laughs> Oh, by the way, um, so I'm not so familiar with like uh, 3D shape generation and like maybe mesh deformation, but from my understanding in, in your, is it like, uh, what, what's that called? Deep cat, cat mark. Mm -hmm. Like if you initialize the mesh from a spell, then that's like a, a genus zero shape, right? How can you generate the, like this kind of shape with uh, very uh, like, different components and not connected components. And, yeah, that's uh, a very good question. And this is a key technique in our paper. So uh, the initialization is, is actually not a sphere. So this oh. is the in, in initializations, like in actual op optimizations, initialization is, is pretty bad. Oh, and we can after, maybe after, let me go to just like several minutes here. This is after several iterations, it can go crazy to go to this, this. Mm. So we can get a very good shapes after just like in the very beginning and it can become much better after that. So okay. this is the, so the, this, is, this is also the main reason why we define something like differentiable isosurfacing operations. So we can initialize with any random initializations. And then after trainings, we can gradually change the shapes towards the final uh, 3D geometries. And the main idea is like we need to make the way to extract this ISO surface to be differentiable, such that we can optimize the underlying SDF. Like, and once the underlying SDF changes, and we can change the final shapes of the um, of the mesh. Oh, I guess it's because in the example here, it's like a spell. Ah, oh, so I was yeah, assuming. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, so it's I mean, random. The, 
yeah, the in, in, in initialization is something like this. And also, even for the GAN trainings, initialization is even more weird because uh, we initialize from a network, so we cannot control what the initialization is oh. like. Like in yeah. our paper, we do some random initialization. I, I, I didn't hack, hack that part. It's just like, I just use, use random initializations for the geometry. See, see, makes sense. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. Yeah, thanks for having me here. It's a great discussion. So I guess if there's more, no more questions, we can stop here and let me stop recording. Let me thank June again for giving this wonderful talk. And yeah, thanks. Great. Stop.